the puzzle pieces for harmony or morality or humanity are the threesome for learning, the cycle of taking a stand, following through, reflecting, and the foursome for knowledge, the four levels, whether, what, how, why. And the challenge of this puzzle is fitting them together. And that's the subject of this video. It is the second in a series of six videos on the meaning of life. As uh, uh, discussed in the language of wisdom that I call wondrous wisdom, this language of cognitive frameworks. I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. In the first talk in this series, I uh, gave a summary of uh, what it means uh, to say that harmony is the meaning of life. And uh, this is an intermediate uh, level uh, application of wondrous wisdom. So it's certainly challenging. Uh, this um, second session will be about some of the fundamentals. And I have discussed uh, quite a few of them in an earlier video because this is all part of a longer series on wondrous wisdom. So if you dig back and you'll find a, a video on the preliminaries, you'll um, that could be helpful if you haven't done that before. But there's a particular uh, structural challenge we'll focus on today is how does learning and knowledge fit together? How does this three cycle by which we perfect ourselves fit together uh, with this knowledge that we imagine is beyond us, outside of us, in our memory, perhaps, uh, and that we access and that we uh, want to have as perfect as possible. So how does that fit together? Because that is very important uh, for the six sum, for uh, the structure that explains what makes us human, uh, what makes us moral, and uh, what has our life be meaningful. And so then after this uh, talk uh, coming next will be the solution, uh, which I discussed in the introductory video, but um, that there are these three permutations. There's a system of values uh, that Plato uh, championed in his uh, book, The Republic. And there is a famous uh, set of values that uh, St. Paul uh, sang the praises of in his hymn of love. And then there's a third permutation which reflects my own uh, view in life in terms of how I value things. But they're basically all different permutations of each other. So we're heading there, but today is about the challenges uh, to think about uh, along the way. So the very basic building blocks, the ABCs of wondrous wisdom are the twosome, the threesome, the foursome, what I call divisions of everything. But these are the most fundamental, and they just keep recurring, and that's the theme of this video. The twosome comes up with questions for existence, the idea that you can have two points of view, like free will and fate, um, and you can take one or the other. And we end up taking both, usually, uh, at one time or another. But those are the choices. And and maybe we don't like that choice, but we're just kind of forced into this framework. So if we um, just study the insides of our minds, just kind of let go as much as possible or ignore our personal experience, but just try to see, hmm, what are the constraints that we find themselves in? Uh, this is the, there are these holistic frameworks, that's the claim. And so my whole challenge is to find other people who could maybe um, confirm that, yes, they too, you know, feel these frameworks when they imagine that they are like uh, blind men and women uh, going through the caves of their mind, grasping for entryways and exit ways and such. This is how I document my uh, inner life. The threesome is a learning cycle for participation, where we take a stand, we follow through, we reflect over and over, and that'll be key today. 
And the foursome is four levels of knowledge. It's a bit more subtle. Uh, this comes up in practically uh, every philosopher's work, every thinker's work. But that uh, when we uh, think about uh, knowledge, we actually have to have four different levels in mind. So two of them are quite practical. Um, what is the sensory information? And how would be, let's say, the uh, information by which we create or uh, use or um, manipulate? And uh, there's a saying in architecture that uh, form follows function, which means like what follows how, which means that how comes first. Okay, so the function comes first, and then that'll reflect the appearance. And then the idea is that, the, and so these are very practical, but if we do this practically, if we make that shift, there is a shift with these two other very strange levels uh, that are kind of like divine, godly, or inhuman, maybe is probably an accurate word. And so weather is saying that, um, well, something could be not observed. Let's say, like, if I put a cup in the cupboard and nobody sees it, is it still there, right? It's a silly question. <laughs> but we, our silly minds can imagine such a thing. So I'm trying to document our silly minds, and so that's one of the possibilities. It's this total ignorance where no one sees it, but it's, you know, possibly there, but there's nothing much to know in that case. But then the opposite is this total knowledge, where it's like for me to know why there is a cup, then I would have to know how it relates to absolutely everything. I would have to know all those relationships. And so if uh, you have seen the video about the Yoneda Lemma, uh, that's very much the spirit of that mathematical idea. You know, like if you, if you, to know a person is basically to know all of their friends, okay, and, and how that relationship with all the friends works. And so what the structure uh, I'm claiming how it's set up is that when the mind shifts from how to what, then we likewise shift from why to whether. But we'll have a context where that's more clear. So putting together that threesome and the foursome, that's the story for today. And so one of the places that comes up, which I just want to mention, um, it's maybe not directly relevant, but uh, when I was uh, teaching ethics at Vilnius Gediminas Technical University, I thought, you know, I'm not going to teach them the history of ethics. I'm going to... Um, we weren't really monitored too much. We could kind of get away with doing a lot of things. I said, I'm going to just teach them how to make their own ethical system. So I said, well, so they need to answer uh, three questions. What should I do? Why should I do it? And how should I get myself to do it? Okay. So here we see uh, this uh, what, why, whether. I mean, what, why, how. And uh, what, how, why. And the weather is missing, of course. Um, why is it missing? And then the idea is that, well, should is distinct from weather that uh, if, if in a certain sense, uh, should implies that uh, weather's, uh, and we, in a certain sense, weather's irrelevant. In a certain sense, weather's given, that it's not about how things are, it's how things should be. And so you just have to have the attitude. It's, in a certain sense, it's idealistic. Okay, and maybe that's a theme to think about. But that morality is idealistic. Like what actually happens, uh, so long as you were committed to do certain things and you lived um, as a person of commitments, right, then um, nature and God and such can have their impact. That's not really what the issue is. But also... Um, this idea of, um, of being, doing, thinking, which is a, we'll see, it's a conception, it's a way of conceiving, taking a stand, following through and reflect, a very subjective way of conceiving that. So, um, like this idea of doing, right? And these are all about doing, but some of them may, may perhaps be like being, right? Or like thinking, right? So, um, and the question maybe would be, I won't maybe try to answer that here, but but which one would that be in this case? And perhaps they can be permuted depending on which way you do it. So this coloring of, okay, what, what does we mean by being and doing and thinking? And how would they fit together with what and how and why? That's the theme uh, for today. Maybe just to say, so when they were building these systems, um, and I have uh, 
practice as an independent thinker, organizing independent thinkers uh, with my online laboratory, Minshu Sodas, um, from 1998 to 2010. So uh, one thing I would ask everybody, I would ask like, uh, it's, you know, when I would meet thousands of people um, at conferences and places, I would ask, uh, what do you care about? Okay, not where they're from and not what, what do they do at work and not uh, why are they here? But I would ask like, what do you care about? Because that lets you person define themselves. So that seemed to be the natural question. Like, what should I do? Well, it relates to what you care about. And then a crucial one is like, well, why should you do it? And I, um, in talking to independent thinkers, I would ask them about uh, to tell me their deepest value in life, which includes all their other values. And I did that as an organizer. So I would understand that we had like 30 different working groups based on such deepest values. So I would know if they would give me permission, which uh, working group to sign them up for based on the similarity to their working value, to their deepest value. Now, here is the master chart uh, that's connecting the, the threesome and the foursome. And the, a key role here will be what I call the three operations on the divisions of everything. So the threesome and the foursome are divisions of everything, which means that um, they are structures that define themselves. If you believe in absolute truth like I do and you're concerned, well, where do we start? You know, what is absolute in terms of any kind of knowledge? Uh, we end up wrestling with this question of definition. And of course, complicated things can be defined in terms of simpler things. But how do you define those simplest things? And uh, they really can't be words. Uh, they have to be concepts, but those concepts have to somehow define each other by way of their relationships with each other. And so you get structural frameworks of perspectives. That's what basically how it works out, is that different ways that we can be looking at things. And so I described the threesome for participation, but here on the left, what I'm showing is um, one way to think about it that, you know, I take a stand, then I shift, I follow through. But in that shift process, if you kind of hold it there, right, there's a question like, I take a stand, but do I follow through, right? And so as I'm shifting there, uh, and so in the sixth sum, which I won't be talking about too much today, except um, making connections with that, because you'll see more about that in other videos. But it is about uh, those, um, you know, reifying, I guess is the word, but treating those shifts of attention, treating them as if they were states themselves, right? So this distinction between what's a state and what's a shift of attention from one perspective to another, from one state to another, that becomes uh, subtlety that becomes relevant here. And so the reason I wrote this three cycle as these three shifts in this way is because um, one of the issues that comes up is, well, maybe that shift can be identified with the third node. So when I ask myself, I take a stand, but do I follow through? You see? And so as you go through, the closer you get to, as you go through, basically you're reflecting. Because the closer you get to following through, the more it will start to be relevant. Well, I follow through, but do I reflect, right? So, or this, or maybe I should be reflecting, right? But so in the beginning, it's not there, but it appears. And so that's uh, kind of like hypothesis I'll make, but I think that that's structurally a nice thing. But, and that's the kind of thing we would want to say, just in the sense of saying that reflection can be defined by identifying it with this shift you see and then that's why the three cycles so powerful because each um state can be defined as a shift from the other two states so two states will define the third even if they're all undefined <laughs> so and likewise so if i'm following through if i'm in the thick of it and then i'm starting to say but do i reflect and as i start to more and more shift over to reflecting the idea is that i'm in the process of taking a stand see because i'm I, I 
because by the time I get to reflecting, then I'm going to say, well, do I take a stand? And I probably have to work on this a little bit more. But And so then finally, like if you're reflecting, you have all these things you've thought about and you've uh, gone through, but are you going to make up your mind again? Are you going to take the maybe original hypothesis you have or, or go against it or clarify it or continue with it? So that's maybe uh, following through as, as you're adjusting that. It's in a certain sense you're following through. So you can see also that this is uh, decades of work in progress, right? That's why we want a community is so that we could uh, double check this, triple check this, keep thinking about it, looking for applications, uh, finding uh, corrections, uh, saying, you know, this just isn't uh, right. Uh, you know, applying our aesthetics that we have. Now, how do we connect this with the whether, what, how, why for, oh, I messed it up. It should say foursome for knowledge. Uh oh, okay. So how do we, um, how do we um how do we connect this? Well, uh, there are um there is this model of the mind, which is I think very uh helpful. And these are actually operations on divisions of everything, and there are three of them. So um because they're acting on a division of everything, and they're acting on it by adding perspectives. So one perspective would take a division let's say it has um, let's say it has two perspectives and if you add one it'll have three if you add two it'll have four if you add three it'll add have five two plus three is five so there are different faculties of the mind different ways of setting up the mind um, that will do that uh, and so the unconscious whatever state you're in because these divisions are reflecting your state of mind if you're into participation then you've got these three it's like you're neurologically like your brain is divided your global workspace as they say is divided let's say into three um, zones uh, and um, carved up into three mental spaces and there's maybe a map of your mind that is where this bookkeeping is done let's say so then you would add a fourth perspective that would be the that would be the unconscious holistically looking at everything but then it itself would have a perspective okay and it has like an answer it's like the google mind it knows but then what the conscious does it says well but we also want to model what we don't know what we need to prepare for uh, so it'd be like a perspective on a perspective and so the way it does it kind of erases that uh unconscious Okay, and so it turns answers into questions. It turns, let's say, uh, something into anything, like a hole. You know, anything's like a hole for something in a canvas. And then, so that would be a perspective on a perspective. That would be like, um, so for the first perspective would be like I. The spec second perspective would be like you. And the third perspective would be looking at the relationship between I and you. And that would be like third person, let's say it or he or she or they. And so that's a perspective looking on a perspective on a perspective. That's the consciousness. And so the consciousness is holding a break. Uh, we may have um, the job of the consciousness is to make sure that the unconscious and conscious are involving in sync. So this unconscious has hundreds of billions of neurons. And the conscious has, it's a conceptual map, has hundreds of thousands of concepts. And it's kind of like the it would be the uh, right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. And so maybe the consciousness is in the basal ganglia, right? And it's uh, relating these two, and it's holding a break. So as the emotion is creeping into the unconscious, it's saying, you know, something's not right here. Uh, I need to articulate something. Something's not uh, working. The conscious is finding all kinds of ways to remodel, re-express its language. But the consciousness is holding it back, saying, Wait, 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 wait. Keep working on it. Keep working on it. And then the consciousness decides, that's it. I want to wire that in. Okay, and then you're at peace. So that's the simple model. Now, the point of this being, the con this, these three things, they're not a division of everything in a certain sense um, because they're acting on something else. You know, in a certain sense, they're not a division of everything. Because, see, well, they're not dis in the sense that they're not describing everything, you know, in the sense that they're just something, you know, we're peeking into the mind from the side in that sense, well, they're, they're not everything. But 
if you add the underlying layer, the underlying reality, so like if you add to I, you, uh, her, let's say, if you add the plus zero, the original layer, which would be God, let's say, God is the zeroth person, then maybe that is everything. Then you would have these four levels of knowledge, like whether, what, how, why. Uh, whether being, let's say, the that zero level, the base level, um, how things are in the world, then what being the first impression sensory by the unconscious, how being uh, the reworking of that algorithmically, procedurally in a conceptual language, and why being um, actually this tiny little system here, eightfold eightfold system, this little clockwork that kind of like is ticking along and 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 basically the spirit of it all saying that, you know, it's maybe this uh, spiritual thread or web or 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 tree that's out there that's um, uh, manifesting, well, just that is, let's say, transcendent to all this, okay, but living through us thereby. That's why we have all this material life. So, so if you think of this unconscious, conscious, consciousness, if you think of experiencing it, then it may quite be that like we experience it as a threesome in a certain sense. But, you know, of course, uh, not in the whole cycle, but let's say just one part of that cycle, you can see all three. Also see, like when we think in terms of God, for God, the threesome isn't really necessarily like a cycle in the sense that like it's complete. You know, God is, let's say, perfect. So God doesn't have to uh, keep going round and round and round. Whereas like if we by nature are imperfect, you know, so we keep perfecting ourselves by going around that three cycle. But if we were perfect, we're just confirmed. Yeah, we're back where we started, right? So um, also um, that in a certain sense, all three of these minds should be potentially like equally valid, uh, equally important, uh, not from the foursome's point of view, but experientially, I think that's what they're trying to do is they're trying to be equal to each other, you know, in a certain sense. So like if you, if you just cut off them from the world and just see how like they're kind of spinning inside because really that's just what they have right they have each other i would think that they have that learning cycle so the goal is to you know this is basically the summary of like the theme of how things will be uh, as we look at different things as you watch the videos to come and so this is just uh saying uh more about that consciousness what i already said that uh, this unconscious knows the answers uh, like in kahneman and tversky's work uh, it, uh, in Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, it would be the system one that's fast, intuitive, associative. And then the conscious is the one that doesn't know, but asks questions, formulates, and thus frames things, and thus, you know, uh, governs by that way. And so it's slower, deliberate, rational, conceptual, uh, what they call system two. And I claim that there's a system three consciousness, which keeps them apart and then binds them together. And of course, lots of our problems are this whole confusion between the unconscious and the conscious, how they're all getting mixed up together, right? Like, And so a big job of the consciousness is trying to keep teasing them apart, like allowing yourself to listen to yourself and let go of your experience and uh, figure out like what is the truth from the heart and what's the truth from the world because when we get that mixed up it really riles us uh, we get we get really confused so these three here you can see them on all eight of the divisions of everything there's an eight cycle the crucial point being that it collapses when you get to the seventh sum well you start with a contradiction god is like a state of contradiction where all things are true and then that thinking of it that way, you can start to see how God goes beyond himself into himself or herself into herself. And you get these levels of um, frameworks, which are kind of like assumptions, suppositions, constructively imposed and building up. Like here you get to the morality for the meaning of life for humanity. And then you get a self-standing system. Uh, so all of a sudden you get something non-contradictory. But then, uh, so that's the logical square. But if you add the eighth perspective, let's say all are good and all are bad. Well, if God and bad are opposites, then, then the system's got to be empty if all are good and all are bad. And then it collapses and you're back where you started, which is great for us. If you want to know everything, we need to have like a finite system basically to play with. So, uh, and if you're into math, advanced math, and uh, coming up is going to be a video on bot periodicity. 
I've been working on it, which is also an eight cycle. And so you know, I'm very just fascinated trying to see, well, could it be this eight cycle? Are they the same? And then the crucial thing is to be able to say there are these equations we should get. So we have eight states of mind. And uh, given what we just discussed about the unconscious, conscious, and consciousness, really they are three operations, plus one, plus two, plus three. Plus one is a perspective added. Uh, to the given perspectives, plus two is a perspective on a perspective, both of them added, and then plus three is a perspective on a perspective on a perspective, all added to whatever state you had, like here's the two sum, so two plus three would be five. So if you are in a state of existence, wrestling with, you know, is this a chair? And so like free will and fate, and like if it's a chair, um, you know, you got to be able to think like, well, maybe it exists, maybe it doesn't. But if it exists and it exists, you know, you have to have two points of view. And so, but if you suddenly become conscious in the sense of consciousness of that, then that becomes decision making. Okay. So, and that would give you like eight times three equations, which is really difficult. To, this is all difficult to figure out because this is not like, something we're sitting in a book this is sitting in the mind the mind is basically invisible you know uh, it's like looking through a glass house it's like a fish looking through water so try to figure that out so we do need to work together uh, join our math for wisdom discussion group and let's be friends leave comments in the youtube um so one of the ways that this becomes a language or you can see that it is works like a language is that uh, there's this very tight metaphysical connection um that these structures have uh, with regard to each other. And so one of the things you notice as you collect examples, let's say, of these four levels of knowledge is that there's two ways to think about them. You have to kind of choose uh, one of two conceptions. And so you either have to approach it as a materialist or as an idealist. So an idealist kind of like thinks that what's real is in the mind, you know, is or in, in our inner life. Uh, a materialist, that's an idealist. A materialist would say, well, what's real is outside of us. It's the outer world, right? That's what's real. So for the materialist, what's real is the answers, like weather is most real. That's out in the world. What is a little bit less real because it's our sensory images. You know, how is some kind of blueprint still a little bit real? Why just seems completely something should be thrown away. It just seems like mischievous and just not necessary for a materialist. Uh, just uh, um, uh, it was taboo in science for many decades. Uh, now it's maybe creeping back in, but not in a materialistic science. See, whereas with an idealist, it'd be opposite. Like, why is the whole point? Okay, that's why as a question. Materialist thinks are questions. That's the big question. How is kind of like a more practical question of implementing that? That's like, why would be the cause outside of our system? Then how would be causes inside of the system, let's say? Then what would be how things look, appear inside the system? And then whether is, yeah, but they have any status outside the system. And like, how could we know? Like, what does that mean? But we can imagine that. We can think about that uh, can't do much with that. So you see, when you want to think about these four levels of knowledge, you kind of have to, you're forced to take a stand, you're forced to take a position. It's like you're forced to be political, right? And so we have horrible, horrible situations. But we can try to work around that by doing funny things, like so someone like a Kant or someone like Pierce will try to straddle these things. They look kind of funny, like they're climbing a ladder or something. So um, with, their, with their legs straddling it, just um, it's difficult. That's what we're trying to do, but a little bit, well, by noticing these things. Another thing to notice, uh, which does come up here in this picture, is that there are six um, what I call conceptions. So you see two of these. One is in terms of questions and answers, or more generally, increasing slack and decreasing slack. Okay, so slack is like an opposite um, and so, uh, but it could be, uh, it's hard to imagine like slack, like the slack is a structure of good, but how do you draw slack? It's It's gotta be dynamic. So it's either gotta be increasing or decreasing. That's how you would imagine it. Let's say like a shoelace, you know, getting tighter or getting looser, but either way, it's got some slack. 
And so that's kind of like directions. Like, so um, if God goes beyond himself into us, like the unconditional goes beyond itself into conditions, right? Or vice versa, the conditional goes beyond itself into the unconditional, back to God, right? Like, those would be the directions, questions, and answers. Uh, I would suppose the, uh, I have to think about that. And that's a challenging, you know, maybe it's the, it's the, it's the questions you are going in or back, something to think about. But um, then there'd be scopes. So the four sum, the five sum, the six sum, the seven sum, they all have two conceptions. Okay. So like in the meaning of life, there will, it's a six sum. It's about a six sum, but it's really about the two different conceptions of the six sum and how they relate, which is very interesting, which would basically be like an equation, like six plus three equals one, probably. Okay, like how the unconscious looks at uh, the meaning of life and how the conscious looks at the meaning of life and then how they get fit together into one would be unity. It would be the, you know, everything would be order, right? So that should be another video. But, uh, and I also should have to figure that out how that works. And to try to discover like that you can define it using bot periodicity. You see, that's where we're headed. But so those scopes, when you go across, so like as God goes beyond himself into himself, like so he starts out just being God, uh, God wishes for nothing is self-sufficient, right? But starting to go beyond, so, so God wishes for something is certain, okay? God wishes for anything is calm. And then God wishes for everything is loving. So including like all the nonsense that we think of, but kind of like a parent love their child and they, they take seriously all the nonsense wishes that the child has uh, more seriously than the child themselves does. So, okay, so this is how God going beyond himself is like kind of like un opens up everything by climbing into himself, by restricting himself. He actually broadens himself in that sense uh, because he's gone through all this, uh, everything instead of just being satisfied with himself, self-sufficient with uh, having ventured off nowhere in the crossing, nothing. So those are the four scopes. So if you look uh, like, for example, at the two sum, it will have four conceptions and they will relate to everything, anything, something, nothing. So everything would be um, the greatest, um, let's say, um, going beyond yourself. Uh, and so two some being, as I said, let's say opposites coexist or all is the same. So the most subjective way to feel that, uh, the most maybe radical way to feel that is free will and fate. Okay, so I think, oh, I can do whatever I like. And all of a sudden, no, <laughs> like I broke that cup and I can't do whatever I like with it. It's broken, you know. And it doesn't really, it's not really about reality, really. It's just about states of mind. Okay. And so um, it's not really about words. Uh, it's certainly not about words. You can think this, you can do this without words. You can imagine that shift where like you feel free that you can do whatever you want. And then all of a sudden you don't. And take those two states of mind and now try to do that without words. Try to imagine yourself like just kind of like uh, having, it's about attitudes. Have one attitude and then have the other attitude and experience that shift in attitudes without words. And then you have started to do the language of wondrous wisdom. You are thinking deeper than words. You're thinking in terms of attitudes, in terms of perspectives. Okay, that's what we're doing. So you can do that though in terms of, um, so that'd be on the level of why or everything, but you could do it on a level of how or anything. Uh, you could take a cup, maybe I'll pull out my cup, I think it's all right. And so a cup is outside, if it's outside, it also has inside. So opposites coexist. But if I fall inside, like I fall inside the universe, you see, the universe is all just inside. There, there's no outside because it's all part of the, everything's part of the universe, right? Like, so you fell inside. Outside doesn't make sense anymore. So outside comes before inside, but not the other way around. Okay. In terms of mental experience. Because opposites, outside takes more energy because it has more states. If you're a physicist, maybe that'll be a nice way to think about it. Like opposites coexisting, you have to hold them together as opposites. It has more energy. Uh, I think I saw a video. I hope this is not wrong or relates. But to have a situation where, like, let's say a uh, you have a, uh, you're flipping a coin and the coin is what they call a fair coin, you know, where it's 50% heads or tails, uh, then in that case, it will... Um, on the average, it'll yield the highest entropy, the highest chance of surprise. 
Whereas if it was like 90% one way or the other, and then 10% uh, with a compliment, um, there's just the average surprise will be less. Okay, this is kind of interesting math, uh, and I have to work on that to be calculated. But so what that says is that in a certain sense, I suppose it says is like, you know, you need more energy to sustain these uh, opposites coexisting. I suppose, in that most opposite way, <laughs> let's say, for them to be truly opposite, like where they have the equal proper probability. That may be one way to kind of play with that. And see, but this is just pictures. This is just metaphors or analogies. Whatever. See, the idea is that there's a deeper structure, but we don't get to conceive that deeper structure. There are four ways to think about this. A free will, faith, outside, inside. Um, theory and practice would be like off and on. So it's like a machine. And that's like what? So you can look like I'm on the or something, right? You can look at a machine that's off and say, well, in theory, that machine could turn on. In theory, it's, you know, it doesn't have to, etc. But when you turn on that machine, it's like if this is if that's all that there's there and there's a division of everything, then you are one with the machine, right? Because you got to be something. So if the machine is on, you know, you've got to be going through the machine. You are complementing the machine. You and the machine are one, right? That's practice. That's like the experience of life. Like life is a machine. We are experiencing. It is our life. It is just one. It is practice, right? It's not theory anymore. So theory comes before practice. That's the point. You, the machine was off, then it gets turned on. Once it's on, it doesn't get turned off. In, as far as we can experience. That's not how our experience works. This is simply documenting our experience. And then uh, same and different, we kind of already did because uh, same would be like, let's say the two coins, um, the two sides of the coin, let's say the same in the sense of, well, then that, but if they're different, if it's 50%, 50%, that's the same. But if they're different, they're just different, you know. But maybe a nicer example would be, let's say two cups, right? And you say, oh, these two cups are the same, but for them to be the same, they also have to be different, right? So that's opposites coexisting. But then you notice, oh, this one's got a crack on it. Oh, they're different, you see. So once they're different, they're just different, and there's no concept of the same, okay? So four conceptions for the null sum, one sum, two sum, three sum. Here they are for the three sum. Now, this is very important um, because um, in terms of the building blocks, which you need to master if you want to speak the language of wondrous wisdom, um, there are the static structures. So the three kinds of uh, families of static structures would be the divisions of everything, most uh, important fundamental. You know, the ABCs are the two some, three some, four some. But really, there's eight of them, starting with the null some, one some, two some, three some, four some, five some, six some, seven some, eight some. So those are, that's like perspectives, okay? And that's kind of like the mind, you know, things from perspectives. But then to conceive them, to kind of grapple with them, or to be able to kind of put some distance on them, uh, you need a perspective on a perspective. And this is maybe, uh, this is where the emotional life basically kicks in. Uh, the unconscious actually kicks in here. And so, um, as far as our experience goes, so, because maybe maybe to say like, uh, in a certain sense, just thinking, but we have a, as experiential beings, you see, as beings who experience through awareness, through like, let's say, attention, Right. We experience through the conscious, through the questions, through the conceptual language. That's how we experience. We don't experience directly through the unconscious. The unconscious feeds us emotions, particularly, say, right? Images, associations, etc. But I suppose maybe crucially, like they have emotional content, right? They're not neutral. I have to think about that. But so I guess maybe the conscious is what is really, so that's at least, you know, I'm speaking, and I'm not going to explain why, now, but there's this huge machinery, right? But so the conscious is coming from, uh, I mean, the, the divisions are being defined by the uh, counter questions, and they come from the mind, they are intelligence. But then um, when you have a perspective on a perspective, that's what allows you to conceive these things. Okay, so you actually think about, you know, see themselves, you could see your mind. Uh, so to see your mind, you either step back and you see it, the whole of it, which is what these conceptions did. So like stepping back and saying, oh, uh, outside, inside. That's how I'm going to uh, deal with the question of existence, let's say, right? But um, the other alternative is you say, no, I'm going to step into it by focusing on a single one of those perspectives, like by basically plucking it out. 
So there's something very important about uh, the division of everything into three perspectives, because that's how we pluck things out. Uh, by um, and uh, it turns out, uh, and I don't know why, but um, you know, but that, that's that's I'm just documenting, right? So first of all, in order to imagine this three cycle of taking stand, falling through, and reflecting, you need to pick one of those scopes, you know. Nothing, something, anything, everything, which basically like the scope for, you know, whether is about knowing nothing, what is about knowing something, how is about knowing anything, and why is about knowing everything, right? So, uh, like in the in terms of why now, and and these are actually uh, this is kind of like a nice part of that little algebra of this language is I've talked about this before, but like, um. These are triggered by mind games. So this does look like Kant's uh, 12 categories. It should look like it. Of course, I was I kind of like figured this out while reading uh, the Critique of Pure Reason, which is something that Pierce was also, you know, really into when he was a young man. Um, so, but Kant derived them by thinking about the form of logic, which basically is like, why, you know, X arrow Y, like Y is a conclusion from X, and you make the deduction by way of this arrow. And that has like four different ways of thinking about that whole logical thing. And it'll give you, you know, you talk about quantity and quality and mode and let's say, et cetera. But I think, um, I think it was, uh, I think that I was able to come to it in a clearer way, I think, you know, at least for me. And I, I claim that it's really more about mind games, okay? So like, uh, and so there are four uh, ways of um, thinking about the, conceiving the null sum, you know, basically God, right? Like, and so it would be um, true, direct, constant, significant. And they happen to be the negations of these four levels of knowledge. Um, maybe I'll just do one of them. Like, so why is this knowledge of everything? But if you negate that, you say, um, no, there are things that are unencompassable. That's what significance means. It means you can't encompass it. And this is the this is the part that uh, Kant didn't believe in, but I'm trying to explain that there's a mind game that works. Kant said that, uh, you know, he said, well, you can have analytic statements, which kind of like uh, formal statements that have like a formal, um, uh, well, like a, they have like a systemic structure. Or you could have synthetic statements, which kind of like pull together through us. Like, you know, somebody has to pull them together some kind of consciousness, let's say, right? Analytic statements can kind of like sit by themselves in a certain sense they don't need us. Um, and then the statements can be a priori, which means they're before experience, prior to experience, kind of like the conscious, right? Or a posteriori, which means that they uh, express experience, you know, they, are de they depend on experience, kind of like the unconscious. And so uh, that gives you two by two equals four kinds. But Kant said there are no a posteriori Rory analytic uh, expressions like you can't get and see analytic are really cool like they're um, they're like logical statements let's say right so like necessary and actual and possible you can get things like you know you can get that those types of things uh, for logical statement but he goes uh, but you can't do it for uh, a posteriori like based on experience and see, so that's, and but he also didn't like Descartes, like, I think, therefore I am. See, but the point is, is that what Descartes was talking about is really, he was describing analytic, a posteriori statements, things that you know, because you live through them, uh, you are able to, um, living through them helps you see them, mm -hmm. which is, so the subjective experience of the learning cycle, like, you know what it like is to be being, and you know what it's like to be doing, and you know what it's like to be thinking. And in particular, and you know what it's like because you play this mind game. The mind game goes like this, like, well, uh, it has to do with significance, like unencompassing. So like, instead of saying, I think, therefore I am, the way to do it would be, I got to get this right. I think, therefore I am, would be to say, well, if thinking is significant, then being is significant, right? Like, if I can't encompass thinking, right, if thinking can't be encompassed, you know, if I have this basically like freedom to kind of like, uh, you know, where where no one can figure out like what I'm going, no one can kind of like, I'm free to think, no one can encompass where I will go with my thinking, let's say, right, or at least that's the, that's the idea. If thinking is, uh, 
it doesn't have to be true, like if that's the attitude, right? Then being is uh, unencompassable. Being is significant, you see? So uh, because then the thinker has to, if you can't encompass the thinking, then you can't encompass the thinker, okay? And then if being is significant, if you can't encompass that, then doing is significant because um, um, doing you can't encompass because um, being manifests through doing, right? If you could encompass doing, well, then you could encompass being, right? That's the, that's the point of the logic because that's how being manifests. So obviously, you know, there's got to be all these things that being is the 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 person is or the individual or the being is doing um, that can't be encompassed because otherwise the person or individual or or creature or whatever would be encompassed likewise. And then if doing is uh, uh, unencompassable, well, thinking uh, is also unencompassable because thinking reflects that. You know, so if you could if you could encompass thinking, well, then you could encompass the doing. That's the idea. So that's um, just one example. If you want to hear them all, go check out the other videos on this, but uh, the preliminary video. Um, but this is important in trying to figure out and play with the three, some and the four, some how they fit together. You have to keep in mind that there's the underlying division. Oh, there's the underlying division, but then there are these conceptions which let you step back. So, okay, like, so there's these four different conceptions of the three, some. But the point was that I almost forgot was that what the threesome is very important for is that it allows you to pick out any one of those pieces. It's kind of like they fall apart. Okay. They all just fall apart. Maybe this is where the unconscious conscious consciousness can come in and kind of zone into the relevant one. I don't know. Something to think about. But this is when we step in. And so uh, also uh, right now we're studying uh, in our sociology study group with Aslam Qatar. Um, we're studying the work of uh, Polanyi, uh, but especially his um, uh, book of essays, uh, The Study of Man. He talks about, uh, and this relates to Gestalt uh, psychology, which I think may be really relevant like to these divisions of everything. Maybe that is passé, maybe Gestalt was a big thing in the 60s, let's say, well, which basically means that the whole is more than the sum of the parts, but we have wholes and parts here, right? And they're holistic, right? Uh, they were doing more like visual studies of how people think, etc. And so, uh, uh, but, uh, but uh, so Polanyi, inspired by that type of thinking, he's talking about... Um, and trying also uh, trying to combat reductionism. Reductionism saying like, well, if you know the atoms, then you know uh, the um, if you know atoms, then you know uh, mi microbiology, you know uh, cell structure, you know frogs, and you know nature, and you know humans, and you know psychology, and you know society, and it all builds up. And so there's no freedom. Everything's deterministic, etc. If you only knew where all the atoms were. And he just makes a very uh, great critique. He says, look, a physicist, if you show them a machine, you know, the parts of a machine, let's say, right? Or even the whole machine, they have no concept, like, what is this machine, <laughs> right? The laws of physics don't tell you, the atoms don't tell you that, oh, this is a machine. Uh, it's similarly like a, a computer does not tell you, the hardware does not tell you, you know, what mathematics is and what mathematics, uh, mathematical truths are, right? And you can implement mathematics in all kinds of ways. You know, the computer doesn't tell you how to implement it. And that's a very big problem with uh, materialist uh, neuroscientists, et cetera. Like they say, oh, left brain, right brain, uh, that distinction, it turns out is not uh, neuro neurologically, you know, validated because it turns out that we find all kinds of exceptions and all kinds of variations. Yeah, but, if you're looking at the user requirements of the mind and you're saying, look, the mind needs a mind that knows and a mind that does not know, a mind that uh, operates on things that we've experienced before and a mind that models and prepares for things that we are not ready for, but we just want to be able to predict anyways, you know, which is the way our mind is built. Let's say, you know, that you are living in a hologram, you are predicting what the world is like, you're looking for differences, right? Like you're extending out into the world. You're doing that abstractly, right? See, so 
if you think of the user requirements, then you see why, um, well, why we need two hemispheres. It's not that it has to be implemented in two hemispheres, but basically you need two big minds and you need something to bridge them. It doesn't have to be so big. And so, um, uh, you know, their picture of why we have two hemispheres is that a fish was hit on the side, you know, and then it survived because it had another, you know, brain. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous that that is, you know, this fundamental thing of brain anatomy survived for 500 million years or 200 million years or how many years because of that, right? And it doesn't explain why octopuses have uh, two hemispheres, which is so strange because they have eight arms, right? Like, uh, uh, why would they have two hemispheres, right? Well, wondrous wisdom suggests why, because the seven sun has this dialogue between knowing and not knowing. And also these three operations have that. So, um, so maybe we move on. And so those are all the kinds of things uh, I think I wanted to have on your mind when we're trying to fit together the threesome and the foursome. Uh, and this is a little maybe uh, going outside of wondrous wisdom and into the realm of mathematics. So this is, uh, if you thought that was speculative, this is maybe even more speculative. But uh, when we study bot periodicity, um, this is coming up, you know, like the complex numbers, uh, the real numbers, the quaternions, and trying to interpret what are they, what's going on. And so um, these two, some three, some four, some, you know, this is maybe just coincidence, but uh, we'll probably, I mean, but we'll see, you know, that's why it's important to not jump, you know, and make connections, but to look at the bigger pieces. That's why the eight cycle is in a certain sense more interesting because if that connects, you know, then it'll tell, me at least, you know, like what the two sum would be or three sum or four sum. I don't know. How does that fit with Clifford algebras? But based on what we have, you know, and it's creeping in, uh, it is uh, creeping in into the ways of um, matrix representations, how, ma how matrices, um, and basically it's saying like a two, two by two matrix will split up into two one by one matrices, right? And so if you look at that, you'll see um, well, you'll see those opposites coexisting. So one way to think about this is that uh, opposites coexisting would be, let's say, like the imaginary numbers, because I, and I keep emphasizing this, that uh, the imaginary number i has a twin, which is called i bar. And they are identical twins. They're absolutely like each other and they are um, indistinguishable. So you don't know when you call one of them i, you have no way to tell which one you called I. They could switch places. You know, you would never know because they have the same properties, you know, basically. You know, it's like uh, you have a theater, you have an actor on stage, right? And there's it's played by identical twins. And they, they could maybe, you know, show up either night, any night, and you don't know who's actually doing the acting. Because for the play, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter for the play. That's how complex numbers work. You really have to focus on this idea of the twins, you know? So I times I is negative one, times I is negative I, times I is one. But you see, if you start with I bar, or you know, which could be called negative I, negative I times negative I is negative one, times a negative I is I, you see? So I or negative I, like negative, it's a bad way to call it negative I, better to call it I, and, I and J or I and I bar, it's a problem. And see, these are problems of conception, of language. We have to be able to think deeper. Um, so whereas let's say the one, and it's all the same, okay? Now, with the quaternions, um, it's very curious that there's two ways to think about them and they kind of fit together, okay? And so one way is to say, well, there's a three cycle. So. Um, you know, it's a four-dimensional space, um, but one of the, the, let's say this letter A is the real number part, and then I, J, K is, would be called the imaginary part. So A is not the interesting part. The interesting part is the I, J, K, where I times J equals K, and J times K equals I, and K times I equals J, and they make this three cycle, okay? And that's why I kind of drew partially uh, that, um, well, that's not the reason why. There's another reason why, but in the sixth sum, but um, 
but to you start to see that uh, the 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 movement kind of relates perhaps to the opposite node. Anyways, there's this cyclical thing to kind of think about. And the idea is that, well, that's modeling learning. So quaternions are somehow modeling learning, okay, uh, from this point of view. But there are four-dimensional, and there's another way to look at the quaternions, which is to say that it's complex numbers where, you know, which is A1 plus BI, where A and B are not going to be real. They're going to be complex coefficients. Okay, so then what we have to do, just because uh, we have to be a little careful what we call these, and just to make it nice, instead of calling it A1 plus BI, I'll call it um, uh, 1 plus, uh, you know, it'll be J. Okay, and then the coefficient, so instead of A, I will use a complex number, which is A1 plus BI. Instead of B, I will use a complex number, C1 plus DI. And then when you multiply that out, you know, you just see, well, you get uh, A1 and you get BI and you get uh, C1 times J is CJ and you get DIJ, well, I times J is K, so you get DK, okay? So it really does work. It is what I promised. Uh, it's complex numbers with complex coefficients. So then you get, it looks like you may get something like this foursome where you have basically two two sums and they're hooked together. Right now, so with the quaternions, you can think of it as a three cycle. You can think of it as a force, and you can think of it how they're fitting together. And you can wonder, well, how are these colors fitting together? And that's basically like when I was twenty four and I was figuring out this meaning of, I mean, it's kind of these structures that I later called the meaning of life um, from Plato and Saint Paul, and then I permuted them in myself. But you can see, like, I thought of them as colored foursomes because you had four levels of knowledge but they were covered, colored with being, doing, thinking, okay? But the let's say the thinking came up in, let's say, two different ones, or it would be the doing or the being, and you'd permute them, and they came in a certain order, and then order was kind of like confusing. It seemed to go backwards or stuff. So what I'm learning now, and there'll be actually a video on what I call the version 2.0, is that uh, the nice way to think about this when you color it would be to reverse the arrows of the force, okay? But another thing to think about when you see this is that um, it also, uh, when you put the threesome in the foursome like this, the way it happens um, based on that data, which is from Plato and St. Paul and from me. Uh, but um, if, if you like that data, if you look at that, oh, it just suggests, uh, and of course I have this bias, but that it's the idealist way of looking at things. You know, we experience the world as idealists ultimately at our core, like in terms of meaning of life, let's say. Meaning of life is an idealist uh, experience uh, of this. Maybe space and time decision-making is a materialist uh, way to think about it. That'd be kind of interesting. So these are, um, and so another way to think about like, to get to the six sum, it's like three sum plus three equals six. Okay, so consciousness of the learning cycle will, to describe the state of mind, like if you have, if you're learning in the learning cycle, okay, and that's your state of mind, but then you get total consciousness of that, you know, the plus three. Well, you had to add uh, three perspectives of that. And so, um, so that you kind of like distinguishing the absolute taking a stand, following through, reflecting with these shifts. So all of a sudden you're noticing all these three shifts. And um, I'm not, um, these, you know, you can imagine like figuring out these equations is hard, but basically like the way it works is, let's say you would have consciousness and unconsciousness, let's say model that. So this is kind of like three plus one. So like this foursome that's colored, it's kind of like an equation three plus one equals four. It's kind of like how the unconscious looks at the learning cycle in terms of knowledge, right? And it's kind of organizing like, well, how is this knowledge fitting in? And then we need to add another two perspectives, um, which could come, let's say, from the decision making. If we keep three of them fixed, like we could add another two. Right? And then when you pull them all together, you get decision making. Maybe I'll work on that. Maybe there'll be a seventh video in this series if I can figure it out. But it could be on the research thing. So here we are. The next one will be the third video. You'll get to see the nitty gritty with Plato, St. Paul, Andres, and the meaning of life. I'm so happy to get to present this to you. And so do leave comments. Uh, do uh, 
look at the description to this video where you'll find information on joining our Math for Wisdom discussion group, our study groups. You can be a Patreon supporter, which is fantastic because uh, we want me to be doing this. I want to be doing this. You want me to be doing this. And then, um, uh, lovely, like, subscribe. Peace. I'm getting a lot out of Math for Wisdom. So for me to put in a few bucks every month, I'm not thinking twice about it. Uh, anybody who joins this group uh, is going to get a lot out of it. So why not throw a few bucks uh, through Patreon into the pot? Uh, Patreon's great. It makes it so easy to contribute. It's two minutes to set it up. It's done.